And welcome everyone to today's Title Topics webinar. These are also free presentations that we offer each month to share important inf information about the industry with our members. I'm Jeremy Yowie, Alta's Director of Communications, and today we will discuss marketing and service agreements. And uh, we hope you walk away with an understanding of some of the key compliance issues and a better feel for whether a marketing agreement is right for your company. Uh, before starting, I just need to touch on a few housekeeping items. A copy of today's presentation was emailed earlier today, earlier today to all registrants. If you didn't receive it, please uh, send me an email at jyohe at alta.org. Again, that is jyohe at alta.org, and I will send you a copy of the webinar. Uh, all participant lines are muted for today's presentation. If at, if at any time you have a question, please use the chat box function, and we will address questions at the end of the webinar. As an added benefit, today's presentation is being recorded after it's processed. Uh, the recording will be available on Alta's website at alta.org forward slash title topics. We need to quickly thank SoftPro for sponsoring our title topics webinars. Their support allows us to continue providing these educational opportunities uh, free of charge. Uh, with that out of the way, uh, let me introduce our... Uh, sorry about that. Let me introduce our uh, expert speaker. Uh, joining us, we have Phil Schulman. Phil is a partner in, in, uh, at the law firm k l Gates and, and is known as one of the nation's top RESPA attorneys. He res represents companies in the mortgage lending, title insurance, and real estate industries in connection with uh, regulatory compliance matters. Phil uh, also develops and analyzes proposed business plans and drafts the related agreements and disclosures uh, based upon applicable uh, federal and state laws regulations and rules, including RESPA, which we'll be, we'll be talking about today. So, thank you for joining us today, and I'll turn the presentation over to you to dig into RESPA, marketing agreements, and the pitfalls to avoid. All right. Well, thank you very much, Jeremy, and good afternoon to those of you on the East Coast, and I guess good morning to those of you on the West Coast. I am Phil Schulman, and I thank you, all of you who signed up for today's ALTA webinar that will address really the prickly issue of marketing and servicing agreements under RESPA. I think without question, interest in marketing arrangements have skyrocketed in the past two years, and yet we're still awaiting word from the CFPB on what constitutes a lawful marketing and servicing agreement on their watch. To date, really, all we have to go by is a June 2010 interpretive rule issued by the Department of Housing and Urban Development during the period of time when HUD was still calling the shots on RESPA. So in the next hour, what I'll try to do is provide you with a primer on RESPA. Uh, we'll emphasize Section 8C2, which is an exemption which we use for permitting payments under marketing and services agreements. And uh, we'll talk about the legal basis for that and uh, how these marketing agreements will work, and we'll talk a little bit about uh, some do's and don'ts. Um, I will also save time for questions at the end. I understand there's a chat room or other ways in which you can send your questions into Jeremy, and when I finish, I'll turn back to Jeremy, and we'll try to cover uh, as many questions as we can during the hour. Those of you who have heard me speak before know that I start out every presentation with a story, and today is no exception, so let me start with that. And it's about the fellow who comes home from work and his wife says, you've got to go down to the pharmacy. I just got off the phone with the pharmacist, and he insulted me, and you need to tell him off. So the husband gets in his car, and he goes down to the pharmacy, and he's ready to lay into this pharmacist, and before he can say a word, the pharmacist says, look, you need to hear this from my perspective before you say a word. He said, look, I got up this morning, my alarm clock did not go off. I jump in my car and I realize immediately that I've locked my house keys and my car keys in the house. I have to break a window, cut my arm to get my keys, and I'm racing to get to the store, and of course I get a speeding ticket. Ten minutes later, a flat tire. I get to the store, there are 15 people waiting in line, and I let them in, and sure enough, the phone is ringing. And I'm waiting on the customers, and the phone is ringing. And I take a roll of quarters and I smack them up against the cash register drawer and they spill all over the floor and I'm picking them up and as I get up I bang my head on the cash register drawer. I stumble into the 
shelf of expensive perfumes and end up breaking $1,100 worth of perfumes. And all the time, the phone is ringing. I finally pick it up, and it's your wife, and she says to me, sir, can you tell me how to use a rectal thermometer? And I swear that all I did was tell her how. Okay, well, I'm allowing time for laughter or uh, other reactions to that story, but I'm told it's a true story. All right, let's go to work. If I can get the PowerPoint working, I did. All right, let's start with a little primer on RESPA. I've always said, and I think this is true, that RESPA is probably the most important and the most controversial statute affecting the settlement service industry because it affects every real estate broker and every real estate agent, every mortgage company and every mortgage broker, and of course, every title company and every title agent. And yet it's a statute that defies business logic because it's the only federal statute I know that prohibits paying someone for putting a buyer together with a seller. However, lenders that solicit referral fees are subject under RESPA to severe penalties. They include criminal penalties of up to a year in prison plus a $10,000 fine per occurrence. I would say that is rather rare, but the more um, likely result is treble damages uh, because RESPA provides that consumers are entitled to three times the settlement service, or in this case, three times the amount of the title insurance premium if there are violations of the anti-kickback provisions under RESPA. Now, RESPA is a dual purpose statute. It is both a consumer disclosure statute and an anti-kickback statute. The idea under the consumer disclosure law is to give buyers and sellers full disclosure of the cost of the transaction. So when you talk about a good faith estimate, a special information booklet, escrow information, and of course the HUD-1 settlement statement, all of those disclosures come to us via the Real Estate Settlement Procedures Act. And I'm sure as Alta has been working furiously to try to coordinate the um, integration of the TILA and RESPA disclosures, which will become effective next August, uh, we will no longer have a good faith estimate and an initial TIL. We'll have a loan estimate, and we no longer will have a HUD-1 settlement statement or a final TIL. We'll have this CFPB-regulated closing disclosure. But those discussions are for another day. The heart and soul of RESPA is really Section 8A, which is the anti-kickback provisions. And the idea here is to eliminate abusive practices, such as kickback fees, because the thought by Congress was that if a lender has to pay or, or a title company has to pay a real estate agent a referral fee, then the cost of the service from the real estate agent is going to go up to cover the cost of the kickback or referral fee. There are five elements to a Section 8A kickback. All five elements have to be present. If any one of the five elements are not present, you're home free. So let's define them for you. Section 8A says that it's illegal to give or receive, number one, a thing of value, pursuant to two, an agreement or understanding, three, to refer, four are, of course, settlement services in connection with federally related mortgage loans. Let me just go through those terms rather quickly for you. A federally related mortgage loan is any loan that's secured by a first or subsequent lien on a one to four family residential property. So it's going to include purchase money mortgages and refinances and adjustable rate mortgages, reverse mortgages, interest only mortgages, and so forth. RESPA does not cover, RESPA does not include commercial loans, construction loans, business purpose loans, all cash transactions. All of those transactions are not subject to RESPA. What about settlement services? Um, I think the way to think about settlement services is those services that are required in order to get a loan in this country are typically settlement services. Those that are not are not settlement services. So anything having to do really by a title agent 
a closing attorney, a real estate agent, a mortgage broker, or a bank are going to be covered under the settlement service definition. So title searches, credit reports, appraisals, the origination of loans, title insurance, flood certifications, surveys, appraisals, tax searches, all of these things which are essential to getting a loan here in the United States are settlement services. Lawn cutting services, pool cleaning services, um, they are not settlement services and so they would not be covered by RESPA. What's a referral? Well, that's any conduct that's intended to influence the selection of a particular settlement service provider. Um, an agreement or understanding, it doesn't have to be in writing or even articulated. It can include a practice or course of action where a receipt of a thing of value is understood. So, wink, wink, you send me title business and I will see that you get $100 in your bank account. So even though there is no articulation of the agreement, it is understood that for every referral that is made, let's say, by a mortgage company or a builder to a title company, would be an agreement or understanding under the definition. Thing of value is broadly defined to be virtually anything that one receives in consideration for making a loan. So typically it's money, but it could be property, it could be a free trip, it could be discounts, it could be low interest rates, um, computers, fax machines, Viagra, I don't know, whatever would be considered a thing of value for you. As I said, the important thing to remember is that all five of these elements have to be present. Any one of them is missing, you don't have a violation. So let's say you have a real estate agent that refers every single customer that they have to ABC Title Company. But the title company doesn't pay the realtor for the referral. Is it a violation of Section 8A? No. You do have a referral. You do have a settlement service. You do have a federally related mortgage loan. But you don't have a thing of value paid for the referral. So one of the five elements is missing. Triple damages for Section 8A, but also triple damages for Section 8B as well, which talks about the splitting of unearned fees. That section says that no person shall give and no person shall accept a split or percentage in connection with a real estate settlement service other than for services actually performed. Um, so you don't need a referral for a Section 8B violation. You just need a payment for no services being performed. This was, as many of you who know the RESPA landscape, a highly controversial subject. Started with um, a Seventh Circuit case involving title insurance in Chicago, Echeverria versus Chicago Title, where Chicago Title marked up a recording fee. I think it was a $30 recording fee, and they charged $38. And the argument was that this was a markup of $8 for no services being performed. But what the court said was, no, the statute requires a splitting of an unearned fee, and since Chicago Title did not split the $8 fee with anyone, they didn't violate 8B. Well, three other circuit courts agreed with the Seventh Circuit and said, if you don't split the markup, there's no violation. But three other circuits, the 11th, 2nd, and 3rd said, that if you mark up a third party fee and you don't do any service, so if you found yourself in New York or Pennsylvania and you charge $38 for a $30 recording fee, they would find an 8B violation. Well, you can't have a statute that's being interpreted by four circuit courts one way and three circuit courts another. You really need the Supreme Court to weigh in and make a final determination. And, and they did in 2012 in a case called Freeman versus Quicken Loans. Uh, the Supreme Court sided with the Seventh Circuit, the Fourth, Eighth, and Fifth Circuits by saying that in order to have a violation under RESPA 8B, the amount of the markup has to be split with someone else. So if a title company charged an extra $10 for a recording fee or a courier fee, but they didn't split it with their employees, 
didn't split it with any other third party, according to Freeman, according to the Supreme Court, no violation of RESPA. This was a big deal for administrative uh, broker fees, real estate broker fees several years ago, and this case was a big boon to them. All right, let's talk about exceptions. Kind of the moment you've been waiting for here. How do you get money into the hands of real estate brokers and agents under RESPA without violating the statute? The answer is you have to find some kind of exception to 8A and 8B, and those exceptions are found in 8C of the Act. So as we say on the screen, look, Congress recognizes certain exceptions are available where you can pay a referral fee and not violate the law. One is payments to an attorney for services actually performed. I'm okay with this one, and I would hope you are. The payments by a title company to its duly appointed agent in connection with the issuance of a title policy are exempt from RESPA scrutiny. That means that if a title company wanted to pay a title agent an 80-20 split and pay another agent a 75-25 or a 60-40, as long as the payment was in connection with the issuance of the policy, the payment does not have to be justified. It is exempt from RESPA scrutiny. Um, cooperative agreements between a listing and selling agent, real estate brokers, are exempt. So if you go to a real estate agent in Colorado and say, I'm thinking about buying a winter home in Florida, and he calls up an agent in Florida to sell you the home, that agent in Florida would give a referral fee to the Denver uh, or Colorado agent, and that would be exempt from RESPA scrutiny. Payments by an employer to an employee. So if a mortgage company owned a title agency and they said to their loan officers, assuming they were W-2 loan officers, um, we will give you $100 for every title order that you get over to our affiliated title company, that would be perfectly permissible under RESPA because that's a payment by an employer to an employee and those payments are exempt. Secondary market transactions for lenders are exempt. You all know about affiliated business arrangements. If they are structured properly, the dividends that the um, owners receive are exempt from RESPA scrutiny. But the exemption or exception that I want to focus on today, the one that we use when we examine marketing and services agreements, is 8C2 of RESPA which says that RESPA does not prohibit payments for services rendered or goods or facilities actually provided, even if the company that you are paying for those goods or those services are in a position to refer you business. The thing is, um, there's a two-part test to determining whether or not the 8C2 exemption is available. Now again, we're talking about a payment for services rendered or goods provided. The first part of the test is the party that you're paying actually has to perform these services. They have to be actual services, necessary services, and distinct from any services that the settlement service provider is already being paid for. So you couldn't pay a settlement service provider for something they already do. You couldn't say to a real estate the agent, listen, I'll pay you $100 for coming to the closing when they come to the closing anyway. So the first part of the test is these goods or services have to be real, they have to be actual, they have to be necessary. And the second and the thornier issue is that the payments for these services have to be commensurate with the value of the goods and the value of the services. As I said at the, the beginning of this webinar, there's been a significant increase in interest in marketing and services agreements over the last two years. In part, um, FHA, for example, raised the net worth requirements for mortgage company, joint venture mortgage companies from $250,000 to somewhere between a million and 2.5 million, and that kind of did away with a lot of 
joint venture marketing, uh, rather joint venture mortgage companies. The new QM, Qualified Mortgage Rules, say that affiliate charges get counted toward the 3% cap while unaffiliated charges don't. So if you're a mortgage company and you own a title agency, as those of you on the phone should well know, the title charges that the affiliated title company charges the consumer would get counted toward the 3% cap if the lender owned the title company. But if the lender chose an independent title company, those fees would not get counted. Another reason why some lenders soured on affiliated businesses. And of course, there are a number of advantages to a marketing agreement. Uh, if you do a marketing agreement with a builder or a mortgage company or a real estate broker, there are no capitalization requirements for them. There's no infrastructure. You don't need any employees. You don't need any office. You don't need equipment. Uh, you're not creating a business. Um, you just have to make sure that the payment is not tied to the volume. So the, the good thing for the realtor is he's going to get paid no matter what. If in fact it's worth $2,500 for you to get your name and your marketing materials in front of his customers, he gets paid that $2,500 whether you get one title order or you get a thousand title orders. So there are advantages to a marketing agreement for the parties that you're going to pay and advantages for you in that you're not creating a business, you don't need to set up an LLC, you don't need to have employees and desks and computers and all the rest of it. Now, MSAs typically are not as lucrative as an affiliated business arrangement, but again, that's the trade-off. Not as much uh, capital requirement, but probably less uh, income than you would get in an affiliated business if it were successful. So where are we on marketing and services agreements? MSAs, I mean, I've been doing them for over 20, almost 25 years. They've been around forever. And it wasn't really until June of 2010 that HUD weighed in for the first time publicly on marketing and services agreements. And it was in the context of a per-transaction agreement, which HUD found suspect. It had to do with real estate brokers who were paid by home warranty companies a fee of sixty to eighty dollars every time they sold a home warranty policy and they did it under a marketing agreement and someone wrote into HUD and said could you comment or discuss this issue and so HUD put out this interpretive rule on June of uh, 2010 and I'm going to talk about what's in that interpretive rule in just a minute. Typically, you have two types of marketing agreements. You have either a flat fee agreement or a per-transaction agreement. Let me start with the per-transaction agreement, which is number two on your screen. That is an example of a payment when there's a sale. So it is unlike the flat fee because if there's no sale, there's no fee that's earned. It's marketing to particular customers, and the home warranty situation would be an example of that. The more common marketing agreement is a flat fee agreement, obviously the most prevalent, and that's a situation where um, you would end up paying a real estate agent $1,500 a month to advertise and market your company to its employees and uh, management. Again, the payment is not for the referral of a particular transaction, unlike the per-transaction agreement. Um, it is payment for specific services. So you say, well, Phil, what, what kind of services could a real estate agent do for me for which I could, I could pay them? And my response to you is that <laughs> the number of services are infinite. They're limitless. We could come up with 500 services. Let me mention a couple. One is signage. They would agree to put up a sign in their offices, at their open houses, maybe even a rider sign on their for sale sign that advertises ABC Title Company. 
they would agree to put your banner on their website and everyone who saw that advertisement could click into a hyperlink and then go directly to your company web page. They could hand out your brochures, maybe have a rack of your brochures in their office or a rack of your brochures at their open houses. You could do co-advertising. Um, there could be, I, I know you're aware of this, sometimes you'll call up uh, a business and you're put on hold and a recording comes on. That recording could say, listen, we at ABC uh, Real Estate give the best service. We have the largest selection of homes in the area. And in addition, if you're looking for title insurance, visit Joe so-and-so at ABC Title Company. So there are a myriad of different services that could be done and could be paid for on a monthly basis. Well, HUD comes out with this interpretive rule and they have a bias against marketing agreements. They don't like them, but the answer is too bad HUD and really too bad CFPB as well because Congress has said that under 8C2, payments for services rendered or goods provided provided you meet that two-part safe harbor test, are in fact lawful. And in this interpretive rule in June of 2010, HUD said marketing agreements are lawful if done properly. But after having said that and gritting their teeth when they did, they tried to chip away at the exemption and they put a lot of qualifiers on this statement that marketing agreements are lawful. Now, these qualifiers that they put on are not statutory. They're not required in the law. They are preferences that HUD indicated they would like to see with marketing agreements in order to give them comfort that it is lawful. Well, what are they? Number one, they did not want to see a marketing agreement where the agreement is payment for direct solicitation to the customer. And so when this marketing interpretive rule came out in June of 2010, a number of us modified our marketing agreements to say that the payment is for solicitation and presentation to the real estate brokers, supervisors, employees, and agents. It is not for directly marketing to the customers. And the reason is because HUD was under the impression that somehow these real estate agents had some kind of voodoo power over consumers and that they had a strong basis for influencing where the consumer goes for services. So they did not want to see a marketing agreement that said, we're going to pay you, Mr. Real Estate Agent, for directly soliciting customers. Putting out brochures, advertising was okay, but not word of mouth directly to. At least the payments were not for that. Number two, um, they didn't like the idea of directly handing consumers information. This, I thought, was a total absurdity. Think about it. It would be okay, said HUD, if you had a rack in your offices with the title company's brochures that wouldn't violate the act. But if the real estate agent plucked a brochure from the rack and handed it to the customer, that would be a problem. Well, if you take that to its logical conclusion, it would seem that it would be okay for the real estate agent to shove the cons consumer into the rack, knock over the rack, and as the consumer is dusting himself off, he picks up one of these brochures. That apparently would be okay but handing it to him is frowned upon. Um, another thing they said is we oppose exclusivity. They don't like to see a marketing agreement that says ABC Title is the only title agency that we, Happy Days Mortgage Company, will do a marketing agreement with. So they want to see something in the agreement that says that it is not exclusive that the mortgage company may, or at least has the right, to enter into these agreements with other title agencies or companies. 
Again, they might not. Or if they do, you may say as a title agent, you know what? I'm not willing to pay you $2,000 a month if you're going to have five different title companies um, marketed in your offices. I'm only willing to pay you $400 for that. Or, you know what? I'm going to cancel my contract with you. But the point is, we frown upon and we discourage you from putting exclusivity clauses in a marketing agreement. They actually wanted um, to make the referor, in this case, a real estate broker or a lender, an agent of the title agent. And of course, that's just sheer madness, and I don't think anybody does that. They also said that they wanted to see some kind of written agreement between the title company and the real estate broker so that there was a declaration of what the services would be and what kind of conditions and terms would apply to the agreement. And that just makes good business sense. So I think preferring a written agreement uh, is not only acceptable, but it, it makes sense. And of course, uh, everybody today that I know does have some kind of written agreement with the title company and the mortgage company or the title company and the builder and so forth. The other thing that they preferred, again, it's not a requirement of a statute, this is sort of a wish list, was they wanted to see some kind of written disclosure. You know that in an affiliated business arrangement, if a mortgage company owned a title agency, the mortgage company is obligated by law to give the consumer a written disclosure which says, listen, in connection with this transaction, you're going to need title insurance in closing. I recommend ABC title. Be advised I own 50% of them. You don't have to use them. You can shop around. This is how much it will cost you if you use ABC title. And then the consumer is obligated to acknowledge by signing the disclosure. So they wanted something similar for marketing agreements. And I know at our firm, we have been supplying uh, clients with these disclosures, which basically are similar to an AFPA disclosure, affiliated business disclosure, and say, listen, um, we receive a fee for marketing and promoting and advertising ABC title. There are lots of title companies around. You're not required to use them. You should shop around, make sure you get the best price, and then have them acknowledge it. So again, not required, but I think it's a best practice. And if anybody should be sensitive to best practices, it ought to be uh, all to members. Um, the one good thing that this interpretive rule said was that in order to determine whether the marketing agreement was lawful, you needed to do an individual analysis. And what does that mean? It means that you need to look at each transaction or each agreement individually. So it kind of destroys the ability for private litigants to bring class action lawsuits in connection with MSAs because you need to look at what happened in that individual transaction as opposed to trying to say that one borrower's experience is representative of every other borrower's. Well, marketing agreements are not without risk. They're controversial and you have to be careful not to push the envelope because, uh, as I said, it's still controversial and we have not had any type of formal interpretation, guidance, or instruction from the CFPB on this issue. In terms of best practices, and I know you guys love that word and you're, you're the king of best practices, so let me give you a couple of best practices here. Number one, I would stick to flat fee agreements. I would not do a per transaction agreement, although in the interpretive rule HUD said that a per transaction may be lawful, that type of marketing agreement may be lawful. Uh, there are too many mines, too many landmines, too many pitfalls. Stick with a flat free agreement. You have to make sure that the real estate broker performs all of the services in the agreement. It does no good for someone like myself to prepare a marketing agreement for you 
which has all the bells and whistles and all the controls, and lists the seven, eight, nine, or ten different things that the real estate broker is going to do for this monthly fee, and then they don't do any of them. So absolutely critical is some kind of audit function in the marketing agreement that says that either on a monthly basis or quarterly basis or from time to time, you're going to audit the broker or the builder or the lender to make sure that they are putting your banner on their website, to make sure that they are handing out your brochures, that they are doing the co-advertising that they promised to. Number three, do not pay for direct customer solicitation. The MSA should not include payment for directly soliciting customers. What we put in our agreements is this payment is for promoting the title company before the broker's employees and agents. And that's what the payment is for. Number four, I said avoid exclusive arrangements. Do not put in an agreement that it is exclusive and this is the only title agency that is permitted to have a marketing arrangement with the builder. Number five, avoid these preferential designations which we know the CFPB doesn't like. Don't say that somebody's a preferred lender or a preferred title company or that they're exceptional or outstanding or superior. Try to do away with the hyperbole. Number six, we're told, and again, we haven't had formal information. We haven't had a formal statement from the CFPB. Well, we're told that they don't like to pay for access to the sales staff. And what happens is you'll see a lot of marketing agreements that say, in addition to putting up a banner on the website and putting up brochures and signage, that the title agency will be permitted on a monthly or quarterly basis to go to the real estate agent staff meeting and make a presentation. What we do in our agreements, and again, this isn't uh, required, but we basically say, here are the seven or eight things that the title agent will pay for, but in addition to that, for non-compensation, the real estate broker will agree to do the following. Maybe he'll agree to give you a list of his customers. Maybe he'll agree to give you some kind of activity report that says, this is how many transactions we closed during this month, and your title company did so many. And in addition, you guys can come to our monthly staff meeting and do a 10-minute presentation, or you can come to our award ceremony, or so forth. Um, again, the monthly fee has to be commensurate with the value of the service, and this is critical. It's another way of saying that the payment has to be fair market value. And I'm a lawyer, so I'm not in the business of telling you uh, with any kind of expertise or specialty that a marketing agreement is worth $1,500 or $1,600 a month or $1,600 or $2,600 a month. I know there are a number of factors that go into determining the value. Obviously, you would pay more for a marketing agreement with a real estate broker that has 10 offices and 200 agents than you would a real estate broker that has one office and 20 agents. So you look at the number of offices, you look at the number of agents, the number of listings that they have, you look at the number of hits they have on their web page, you look at the circulation of and uh, eyes that see their advertisements and so forth, and all of those things factor into what constitutes fair market value. The truth is, in this day and age, with so much enforcement uh, being undertaken by the CFPB, you ought to have an independent third party value what that marketing agreement is worth. And there are third party companies out there that do that sort of thing. That way at least, if you get called on the carpet by the agency or by a court and they say, well, how in God's name did you come up with $4,500 a month? The answer is we went to this valuation company. They said it was worth between $4,000 and $5,000 a month and that's how we determine the monthly fee. So an independent verification is strongly encouraged. Um, what about changes to the marketing fee? 
you could probably change it if there are objective reasons for changing it. I would never change it based on production or volume. You know, hey, we were charging you $4,000 a month and we expected you would get about 20 title orders a month. It turns out you're getting 40. We want to up the marketing agreement to 8,000. That would be a mistake. Um, but if it's a change in the business model, you were paying a marketing agreement of $2,000 a month and the real estate broker had four offices and now he merges with another broker and he's got 12 offices and instead of 100 agents, he's got 300 agents. That would be a basis for increasing the monthly fee. Same would be if it went in the other direction. He had 300 agents and 12 offices and now he's down to three offices and 100 agents. That would be a reason for decreasing the marketing fee. I talked to you about providing services for no compensation, and I think access to sales meetings, conducting customer satisfaction surveys, providing the company with monthly reports about services, activity levels, other kind of data, um, would be permissible, uh, I would think. So, in terms of compliance, look, this is still a controversial subject. Um, I think you would be wise to get some legal counsel on this stuff. I can't imagine anybody off the top of my head that I could recommend, but I'm sure there are lawyers out there that do this sort of thing. Um, but we also have a new sheriff in town because HUD is no longer calling the shots on affiliated business. The CFBB is. I know that they are um, weeks or a few months away from announcing a settlement, a consent order, on a marketing agreement and once we see that the public will have some idea as to what are the hot spots and the do nots that the agency objects to but right now we basically just have the HUD 2010 interpretive rule to go by so the best thing I can tell you is if you're going to do a marketing agreement make sure their actual services the services are actually performed for fair market value and um, we'll wait to see what the CFPB says on this subject. Jeremy, that is my uh, formal presentation. Um, I've got some questions that came in so I'll try and answer those and uh, if you have some, why don't you jump in and ask me as well. So. Um, let me take a few here. One is, do you need to be a certain size company to consider a marketing agreement? What about a one, I can't read this, is it a one county operation? One yeah, county operation. Yeah, one county, Phil. Okay. Um, my answer is this. The size of the arrangement, the size of the company, rather, will dictate what the fee would be. I've seen marketing agreements for $500 a month and I've seen marketing agreements for three and four million dollars a year. So I don't think that there is any particular size, it's just that the size is a determinant in figuring out what the monthly fee ought to be. But I will say one thing, I get asked what about doing a marketing agreement with an agent? or some individual who's got a team of three or four or five people. I discourage my clients from doing those agreements. I only write marketing agreements between companies, not between a real estate agent and a title company. Because if you want to talk about a banner on a web page or signage in an office, uh, an agent doesn't have those kinds of things. They don't have an office. Uh, they don't have staff meetings. They don't have um, the kind of uh, extensive advertising that you would get with an office that has 20, 50, 200 agents in it. Okay. So, How do you prove payment for services is fair market value? Well, as I said, what I would do is go to a third party company. Um, because unless you have worked out some formula that you think is sound, the last thing you want is for a regulator to come in and say, well, how is it that you decided on $4,000 a month? 
Well, we thought we would get 20 orders a month from the real estate broker at 200 bucks a piece, and that's how we decided it. That would be a wrong answer. So um, my suggestion is go to a third party, and then whatever estimate they give you or whatever range they give you, stick to the low end of the range. Don't go up to the, the highest dollar amount. Give yourself some breathing space um, so that if there is some question, you're at the low end of the estimate and not the high end. Um, thoughts on rental space and marketing agreement. Can these be drafted together um, in the same document? Okay, well, we were talking about marketing agreements, not facilities, renting facilities. Renting facilities are fine. Um, there's nothing wrong with a title agent agreeing to uh, rent a desk or to rent an office from a builder or a mortgage company or a title co uh, a real estate broker. Same rules apply. The payment has to be fair market. Typically, it's based on the square footage. Um, I don't think there's a hard and fast rule as to whether you put the office rental in the marketing agreement or make it separate. When I have done them, I've done them either way, but when I do them together, we have two different valuations and two different figures under compensation. So we're going to say office facilities. Real estate broker agrees to provide title company with 100 square feet, a desk, a telephone, use of the fax and computer, um, and we're going to pay $750 a month for that based on square footage and those facilities. And for the marketing agreement where we're going to do the website, we're going to do the co-advertising and the signage and the brochures, we're going to pay $2,200. So we have $2,200 and $750 and they're both in the same agreement. Or you can do them separately. I don't think there's a hard and fast rule. Separate might be better in the sense that uh, at least you're separating the two. But um, I would avoid saying we're going to pay $3,000 a month for both because then a regulator doesn't know how much you're attributing to the desk and how much you're attributing to the market. Okay. Um, we've seen enforcement actions from the CFB targeting AFPAs. Do you anticipate any action from them regarding marketing agreements? Well, we know that the CFPB has been surveying companies about their marketing agreements. I know this because clients of mine have been asked to supply copies. So I know that this is on their radar. Um, I know that um, a company mentioned to us, to our firm, that um, they, well, what they said is, geez, I wish we had hired you guys, but we've already entered into a consent order with the CFPB or we're about to sign one. So knowing that they're about to sign one tells me that at some point in the near future, we're going to see a press release and a consent order on marketing agreements, and that will give us some idea as to where the CFPB's head is on this stuff. Uh, I will say this. Um, there's no question that this is a hot topic, and you need to be careful that you dot your I's and cross your T's. Um, next question. Since RESPA does not apply to commercial transactions, do you have any thoughts on situations where a company may require a work share agreement on commercial deals? Um, that is outside of this topic, um, but at least I will say this. Number one, of course, RESPA does not apply to commercial transactions. So uh, all the rules of anti-kickback and treble damages and so forth are uh, off the table. Uh, but I think you have to be careful and look at the state anti-inducement laws because you still have rules that apply to commercial and residential transactions where you're not supposed to pay things for uh, or a portion of the fees that you get for premiums to third parties for assisting you. A work share is a different story. That is really um, a situation typically the ones I see are typically where a company maybe is not licensed to do title work in state B, they're in state A, and so they send the title order 
over to an agent or a title company in state B, and then that title company in state B hires the title agent in state A to perform some work for them. Um, you can make an argument under RESPA that that's lawful, provided that it's real services and the amount that's paid is commensurate with the value. You've got an AC2 argument. Um, there are biases, I think, by some of the state regulators that they don't like these arrangements. They don't see the business purpose of them. But um, as an intellectual matter or as a legal matter, if structured properly, um, there's an argument that they could be lawful under HC2. Jeremy, I don't have other questions. Do you have any other questions for me? Uh, we, have a, we do have a few more that have come in. Hopefully my audio isn't uh, too bad. Phil, can you hear me? I can hear you. I've got about four minutes here, so. Shoot. Okay. All right. Well, we had a few come in that, that address real specific situations, so we're not going to touch on all those. If you have a question about uh, compliance, uh, please reach out to Phil. I'm pretty sure he can uh, help you out or find someone else who can. Right, Phil? <laughs> uh, we're in the business of helping out people who have legal questions. Right. A um, couple more questions, and we'll call it a day. Um, you touched it touch on this a little bit. Um, how do you prove payment for services are of fair market value? And if you are using a flat fee, is there a fair market value for using a flat fee? Well, again, um, these questions are all centering around how much do I pay? And that's a very good question to ask because it's not enough to create an agreement that requires the real estate broker or the builder or the lender to perform services, the amount that you pay them is equally as important. Because if it's worth $2,000 a month to get your banner on a website that gets 10,000 hits, if you pay somebody $20,000 a month for that service, you're not paying them for getting your banner on the website. You're paying $18,000 more than you ought to. And a regulator would say that that extra 18000 is a kickback for the referral of business and is not for services rendered. So you have to be careful to make sure that you can justify um, how much you pay. And there has to be a method to your madness. Not every title company that does a marketing agreement goes out and gets a third-party valuation. Um, some of them say, look, we've got a formula, and based on... If it's 10,000 hits a month, we pay this. And if it's 50,000 uh, hits a month on a website, we pay you know, five times X. If they have 300 listings, we pay one price. If it's 200 listings, another. So that a regulator can see that there's some method to your madness. Because I don't think there's any uh, rule out there that says you have to pay X dollars. Uh, it is subjective in some respect, and you just have to be able to prove to a regulator that you're within the framework, within the area of reasonability. Um, you know, whether it should have been $1,425 and you charged $1,500, I don't think anybody's going to get bent out of shape. But if it should have been $1,425 and you charged $14,000 or paid $14,000, that's going to be a different story. All right, right. All right, I think we got time for one more question, Jeremy. Okay, yeah, and uh, just maybe two follow-ups to that real, real short if you can. So how do you document that the services have been rendered? And then any recommendations for third-party valuations? Um, how do you document that the services have been rendered? Well, what you're talking about there is some kind of an audit procedure. I've seen it done different ways. Um, sometimes the title company will have a sheet that they require the mortgage company or the real estate broker to fill out where they say, you know, we put out this many brochures or we um, did this kind of advertising or have them check boxes and sign it so that there's some certification by the realtor that they have in fact performed. Or I've seen other times where on a quarterly basis the title company will go into the real estate broker's office, kick the tires and make sure that they are doing each of the excuse me each of the items that um, are in the agreement. As for can I make recommendations? Um, 
surprisingly, there are only a couple of companies out there that I know of that do these valuations. And if you reach me offline, I can give you some names. I will tell you that we don't endorse anybody at K&L Gates. We don't vouch for them. We're not in the business of determining uh, what is or what isn't fair market value or who does a great job or doesn't. But we do know companies that do it, and you can talk with them. And there, there are at least two companies that I know that, that do this regularly. Okay. Well, um, that that all right. I, we have. Hey, Phil, you still there? I'm here. All right. Uh, we're about at the top of the hour. Um, you any other questions, or, or you want to call it a day, Phil? Um, I will call it a day, Phil. Uh, <laughs> I will say this. Um, I always enjoy speaking to the American Land Title Association and its members. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to spend an hour with you on this topic. Uh, obviously, we touched the surface and we hit on from 30,000 feet the kind of issues that you ought to be thinking about, but uh, there are many different variations and, and more complexities to this, and uh, to the extent that you are looking for some help, uh, certainly give us a call or give any attorney who specializes in this area a call before you venture into an area that you know is being looked at by the regulators. So again, thank you for inviting me and thank you, Jeremy. Yeah, we just scratched the surface on the uh, the questions that were asked and there were, there were a lot of good questions. So I encourage you to reach out to Phil or as Phil said, uh, another RESPA attorney. Uh, Phil can be reached at phil.schulman at klgates.com. That's P-H-I-L dot S-C-H-U-L-M-A-N at K-L-G-A-T-E-S dot com. Uh, again, his email and contact information is included in the presentation. You can also shoot me an e email with any questions at jyoey at alta.org. And as a reminder, today's presentation uh, was recorded and uh, will be available for replay uh, early next week. Looking ahead, our next Title Topics webinar uh, will be held in October, and we will address uh, five easy ways to lock down data. Uh, we plan to have a representative from a major lender participating who will share uh, some of the banking solutions they offer to the title and settlement services industry and we will also we also hope to have a, a title agent participate to share some of the challenges that they overcame when implementing best practices uh, to protect data and funds so be on the lookout for registration information for that web webinar uh, Phil thanks again uh, for spending an hour with us a lot of great information um, hopefully we, we can hear some more of your stand-up comedy and uh, that will bring us to the conclusion of today's presentation. I hope all the listeners found the uh, webinar useful. Take care, everyone.